pray, Father, that my heart would be yielded enough tonight that you would stir it and help me not just to be challenged, but to be changed. I want to love and serve you better. Every time I hear a message, I want to have it change me and help help it to make me a better Christian. And, Lord, I hope that would be the prayer of all of us tonight. And so, Lord, in the next several moments, please have your will and way in each of our hearts and lives. And, uh, again, I, I, I pray you challenge us tonight through the, through the message. I think it will be a challenging type of a Bible study. But, Lord, also uh, help us to apply it to our lives without uh, applying it. Uh, it, the, our, our time will be uh, spent in vain, and we don't want that to happen. So, Lord, bless the teaching of your word tonight. Give us, please, your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to follow along with me. You can remain seated as I'll read tonight. And again, I'm in Mark chapter 12 and verse number uh, 28. And the Bible says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like, uh, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that durst ask him any question." I want to talk tonight. We've been answering different questions in this Bible study series, and I want to ask the question. We'll answer it through the Bible study tonight. How does God want us to love Him? And we'll study that tonight. How does God want us to love Him? And uh, let's see, Paul, if you can get out there, we're going to have you pass out an outline to anybody that would like one. Just one page tonight. There'll be a front and back. Is there anyone that would need a pen tonight? We will even get a pen into your hands if you need one. You're all good to go. Very good. Mark chapter 12 is where we're going to be tonight. I want you, as you're getting that outline, the uh, four or so points will be uh, the ones that you'll need to fill in on your outline, and we'll give those to you as we progress through that outline tonight. But Mark chapter 12, as we talk about how does God want us to love Him. People often go into sin because they fear a God they think does not love them. Uh, If you felt tonight like God loved you, and uh, don't answer this out loud, rhetorical type of question, would you continue to do some of the things in which you do? Love is the great motivator. I believe the greatest motivator. There's all kinds of things that motivate people to do what they do. And stay with me, and I'm not talking on the outline now. You can look up at me. And, uh, but love is a great motivator. We, we do what we do because of many different things. You might go to work tomorrow because, not because you love your job, but you might love getting the paycheck that comes in, but maybe you go to work tomorrow because of duty, and that's a good uh, reason to do something. We ought to do what we do just because we're supposed to do it. Uh, some people do what they do because of fear. Uh, and uh, God uses uh, that tactic, and uh, it can be used by a parent. You, we, we've often heard the expression that uh, I'm going to put the fear of God into that boy or that girl, and uh, certainly that's uh, a way to uh, help motivate people to do something. Uh, we can certainly be motivated to do something uh, out of duty or fear, but I, I believe the best way to be motivated to do something is with love. God uses the uh, measuring rod of love, if you will, to determine uh, how devoted that we are to Him. The barometer of of our our love of God is our obedience to God, and we're going to talk a little bit about that down the road here tonight. But love is a testimony of God's presence in your life. And uh, the Bible says there, it's on your outline in 1 John 4, 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. One of the great 
uh, signs of uh, uh, not only a Christian but a, a devoted Christian is the presence of love. This this thing we've been studying on Sunday mornings, this agape love, this deep abiding love that that God has. And and when you realize in your life how much God loves you, it ought to motivate you to want to do anything in the world that God would want you to do. I believe that we ought to come to church because Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 25 teaches us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And I believe that's just as much of a commandment of God to go to church as it is not to get drunk or to commit adultery or any of the other big sins that we uh, like to point out in, in the Bible. But I don't go to church just because it's my duty to go. Uh, the number one reason I go to church is because I love God. And I realize that God loves me. And I realize that God wants me to be here. And because God loves me so much and because I realize how much He loves me, I want to do anything in the world that He wants me to do. And to be real honest tonight, I don't under... And if I'm ever honest again, I'll let you know. But uh, to be real honest, I don't understand a type of Christianity that, that doesn't have a motivation driven by love that says, God, I'll do anything in the world that you want me to do. It is true that, you know, the, a lot of my time, and most pastors probably would agree, spend their time, like I do, begging Christians to come to church. When we ought to spend most of our time trying to reach the lost to get them saved, we have to beg Christians and plead with Christians and send out emails all week. And I'm not opposed to any of that. I like to do that. And letters and postcards, and we've got all kinds of promotions. Mostly, however just to draw God's people here. And basic Christianity 101 is just saying, you know what, I realize uh, God loves me enough that He saved me out of hell. The very least I can do is get up out of bed on Sunday morning and come to church. I mean, that's just basic Christianity that, you know, if I just... I realize my my wife loves me. I I, want to please my wife. My children love me. I want to please my children. Church, I love the pastor. pastor wants to please the church. But most importantly, I realize tonight that God loves me. And it's a pure, uh, unconditional love that saved my soul 18 plus years ago out of hell. And I'll tell you what, tonight, that I've never gotten over the fact that Jesus loves me. And I'll do anything in the world He wants me to do. We're in Arizona just these last few days. And uh, and, uh, I'll tell you what, if God said go there and start a church, I'd be heartbroken to leave. But I'll tell you what, I'd move out into the desert if God wanted me to move out there. Now, I wouldn't want to go there, but if God wanted me to go there, I'd go there. I'd do anything God wanted me to do. Why, Pastor? Because I love God and He loves me. Love is the best motivator. And uh, Jesus taught us how we're to love Him. And I want to give you some understanding because these are very familiar verses. And I've often wanted uh, to, to take a, maybe a Wednesday night Bible study series, and maybe we'll do it down the road. And I want to just teach all the very familiar verses in the Bible that we all know but we're not very good at doing what they tell us to do because we just know them so well. John 3.16. Everybody here almost could quote that, but what's that really mean? There's a lot of good truth there. One day we'll do that, but this is certainly a familiar passage as well. I want you to look at your Bibles again with me. And um, in verse 29, Jesus was answered, uh, asked a question back up in verse 28. It says, which is the first commandment of all? And then we see the answer here by Christ in verse 29. Jesus answered, the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. By the way, that first word Jesus said there is hear, listen. Uh, You can't hear the word of God unless you're here to hear it. And so it's very important to be in church. But he goes on to verse 30 to say, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. How does God want us to? To love Him. And that's the outline right there, those four things. Number one on your outline, God says, I want you to love me with all your heart. Now, again, we've heard that verse many times. Probably if you've been saved uh, uh, just a little bit, you've heard it. If you've been saved a long time, you've heard those verses over and over and over and over again. But I think it's very easy just to say, you know what, we read it. God wants me to love me with all His heart, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind and strength. Okay. What in the world does that mean? Let's get into it just a little bit tonight. Uh, big problem, Jesus says, right off the bat, he wants us to love him with all our heart. 
And when I think about that, immediately I'm drawn, and I put that on your outline there to Jeremiah 17, 9, because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Matthew 15, 19 says, For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications, thefts, false witnesses and blasphemies. And uh, out of that heart where all those things proceed out of is the very place where God says He wants us to love Him. And I often think about that, and, you know, in my thinking, I'm, I, I say, God, there's got to be a better place that we can love you out of than that one place that you say is so wicked, we don't even know how wicked it is. I'd want to maybe pick another part of the body that wasn't so bad as the heart. I mean, good night, thoughts of evil and murders and adulteries and fornication, all the sin and the filth that we commit comes out of the heart. And God says, that's the very first place I want to tell you to love me. And what's God trying to say? And I put it on your outline there, and I believe it's this. God wants us to put the same time and energy and resources into loving Him that we put into ungodly things, uh, many of us throughout most of our lives. For the first 24 years of my life, I lived uh, uh, totally opposite of the way God wanted me to live. You know what, for many of those years as I became a teenager and a a young man and I began to work uh, and made money, I put literally thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into sin. I put a a lot of money, hundreds and thousands of dollars into the the, the things of this world out there. You know what God's saying when He wants me, when He says, I I want you to love me, Pastor, with all your heart, is He said, can you take all the, the money that you put those first 24 years into the world, into the flesh, and the things of the devil? How about for the, 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 the next part of your life, now that you're a child of God, putting that same amount of energy and that same amount of effort and that same amount of, uh, of money into the things that please me? And God said, out of that same heart that all that first part of your life was evil and wicked and sinful, and yet you took time and energy and years uh, to pour into that lifestyle, God says, out of that same heart, I want you to love me like that. Can you love me for 24 years, Jesus says tonight, like you love sin for 24 years? Can you love me, Christian, for 24 years? Jesus says, like, you lived and loved the world for 24 years. And, boy, you look at the world tonight, and they're a hell-bent for their cause. They pour millions of dollars into their cause, billions of dollars into their cause. They're not ashamed, by the way, to promote what they believe in. But yet we're afraid to speak up for Jesus Christ. You know, I would have to think tonight that God looks at the world and says, you know what, the same heart that they have that's evil and wicked, and they put all that time and energy and talent and money and effort, uh, and they're just undying into their worldly causes. God said, the, I wish the Christian would take that time and energy and put it into loving me. And that's why God says, I want you to love me out of your heart, God wants us to put the same time and energy and resources into loving Him that we put into ungodly things. For many years, I don't know how many years I smoked cigarettes. I think it was about seven or eight years. I don't, I don't, uh, I've never gone back and figured out how much money I gave to Cam- the Camel Cigarette Company. But I'll tell you what, I, I, I ought to at least take seven, eight years out of my life and give a lot more to God than I gave to a Camel Cigarette. You ever notice how it's real, you know, you take $20 and go down to Walmart, that's not much money. But the offering plate comes down your row, $20 is a lot of money then, huh? Isn't that funny? You know, an hour at the ball game goes like that. An hour in church? When's that guy going to shut up? And God is simply saying your heart's wicked and evil. And God said, I want you to take the time and the energy and the talent and the, the sweat and the, 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 the money and the sacrifice that you gave to sin and to your own way of doing things and, and put all that time and energy and talent and effort and sweat and tears and sacrifice into loving me. That's what it means. Four simple things to do there. Decide once and for all to put God first in your life. 
It's a very basic statement, but again, most Christians never do that. It's not just something there to fill up uh, a little bit of space on your outline, but there's got to be a time, Christian, when you get alone with God on your knees and you make a vow to God that says, God, again, there's nothing or nobody that's ever going to take me out of your will. And I'm going to talk about this just down the road. This is one of the points of Jesus saying how he wants us to, to love him. But there's got to be a time where you commit to God and say, God, I, I, I am going to sell out for you like I sold out for liquor all those years. I'm going to sell out for you, God, like I, I sold out for football. I'm going to sell out for you, God, like I sold out for my, my career. I'm going to sell out for you, God, like I sold out for, for tobacco or, or drugs or, or whatever my sin of choice was. Or if I was just a good, decent human being, but I gave a lot of time and talent and energy to something other than you, God, I'm going to take that same time and talent and energy and pour it into your kingdom. you got to decide that or it ain't going to happen. And why most Christians struggle and why most Christians just never nail down basic fundamentals of the Christian life, like going to church and reading their Bibles because they've never gone to God and said, Today, God... I commit to you, I'm going to do it. I commit to you, God, I'm going to read that book every day. I commit to you that I'll be in church every time the doors are open. God, I commit to you to be a soul. You know, by the way, that's what the altar's for. That's why we, are, we have altar calls. Uh, because you come and you tell God the decision that you're going to make because of the truth that you just heard. And, and again, that's just good, basic Christianity. Churches erred greatly, many have, when they got away from the altar. He said, that's not real seeker sensitive. Well, well, you know, it's funny. I find that all throughout the Bible, God told people to build altars. They're decision-making places. God's very big on that. And so decide once and for all, folks, to put God first and decide to love Him. And if, if you've never done it, I would look at your life and say, God, uh, I can see all those years and all the, the effort that I put into something other than you out of that wicked heart. And God, I, I vow tonight to, to take all that time and energy that I wasted on other things. And God, I'm going to devote that much time and talent and energy and sweat and money into you. And God, I decide it right now. And nobody's going to pull me away. Not my spouse. I hope my spouse. I thank God my spouse follows my faith. My wife's a godly lady. I couldn't imagine if she wasn't. But if my wife decided to quit on God tonight, I'll still serve God tomorrow. I don't serve God because of my wife. I serve God because of God. I don't preach for you. I preach for him. You're not my boss. He is. I'm your pastor, and you're the people of the church, and I'm just a member here like you are. But I do what I do because of him. He's my great motivator. I love him. He loves me, and he wants me to love him like I loved that world out there all those years with just as much. And I'll tell you what, I was pretty zealous. I'll tell you what, I'd do anything to get enough money. Back in the day when I smoked, it was 99 cents. You'd get a pack of cigarettes. I know it's about $100 a pack right now. I don't know. I, I couldn't smoke today just because I couldn't afford to do it. But I'll tell you what, back in, I, I'd do anything to find 99 cents. I didn't have it. I, I'd find it somewhere. I'd, I, I'd get it. I'd ask around. I'd search. I'd look. I, I'd do anything to satisfy my sin. I, 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 I wouldn't stop till I got it. And that's how God says, I want you to serve me. Put your treasure where your heart needs to be. We're all talking about how to ha ha have your heart uh, and love God with all your heart. So you've got to decide once and for all to put God first. Uh, let her be there. Put your treasure where your heart is. The Bible says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So I'm not going to cower down to getting you to invest here and invest in the church because God wants your, your heart here. And wherever your treasures, whether that be your money or your time or whatever is precious to you, wherever you invest that in is where your heart's going to be. You can say all you want, I love God with all my heart. And I'll say tonight, show me your checkbook. Show me where you spend most of your time. Show me what you're most devoted to. It's amazing to me how, you know, people tell me I, I can't sit in the church because it's bad on my back, but I can sit in a deer stand for six hours. But you can't sit on six inches of cushion for an hour? I can't go soul winning. I, I, I can't walk doors and go out knocking on doors for an hour, but I can go to the mall for three, four, five hours 
and walk around. God says, your heart. Do you love me like that? Ladies, you go to Walmart or maybe you men even. I, I, I hate to shop. I, I, I like to buy things. I don't buy much, but I, I go in. I know what I'm getting. I go out. My wife and I can't shop together. We almost get divorced every time we try it. It just doesn't work, so we just stopped it. Usually if we're in the store together, we'll say we'll meet back here at a certain time and we go our separate ways because it's not what I like to do. Now, if you're a man and you like to do that, well, I'll pray for you. But I'm, I'm simply saying it, we, can, we can devote ourselves to, to shopping or fishing and sports, and I like all those things, and I'm all for it, and I hope you men are manly men. But God is looking. You know, if a man can sit in a deer stand for 12 hours in a day and can't serve his God in church three or four hours a day, there's something wrong with that man. You can sit out in a fishing boat all day. And by the way, you don't even have to catch anything and you still have a good time. You can come to church, sir, for three hours on a Sunday. Sunday morning, Sunday morning. Don't you tell me you can't do that. There's something wrong with that thing right there. And God says, that's how I want you to love me with that heart. Put your treasure where your heart needs to be. Obey God's commandments. Again, the barometer of God measuring his love for you is is obedience to his word. Then let your emotional highs and lows take you to Jesus. It's amazing in the world tonight. You know, the world has a, uh, something that good that happens to them. They celebrate with sin. They have something bad that happens to them. They, they, they go to that sin. Sin is a coping mechanism to help them get through that, that tough time, whatever that sin of choice may be. And God says, you know what? When you love me with all your heart, I will be where you flee when you're up and when you're down. You know how to know when you're a good Christian? You know how to know when you're free from addiction? If you struggle, and I tell this and teach this to our Reformers Unanimous students on Friday night, that one of the great signs that you're becoming free is when you have that bad day, your first thought is not to go back to the bottle or the cigarette or the drugs. Your first place uh, of thinking to flee to is Jesus Christ. And when you have a high day, something happens that's great, and boy, the first thing you think about is not celebrating with Jack Daniels or Jim Bean, the first person you want to celebrate with is Jesus Christ. And say, oh, God, thank you. You're awesome. And your emotional highs and lows should lead you to God. That's how you know that you're loving him with all your heart. Number six, God said, I want you to love me with the soul. With all your heart, with all your soul. That's point number two there. The soul represents tonight, just for the basis of our message, the seed of choice, we'll call it. The soul is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. We're going to get into the mind here in just a little bit. But it, it basically is the identifier of our individuality. It makes you you. It, 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 it's your chooser or how you make choices or better yet, what you decide to do. God wants to be in your chooser. He wants to be in every choice of life. And when God says, I want you to love me with your soul, God said, every little decision of life, I want you to include me in those decisions. And I've taught you this before. And and when you go to buy a tube of toothpaste, you ought to ask God, "What, what brand should I get, God? Just as much as you'd ask him, what car should I buy? Or whom should I date? Or God, I'm praying for my future spouse. Or God, what do you want me to take this job? There are no little things that God says, you know, I'm uninterested in. God says, when you love me with all your soul, you are loving me with every choice that you, you make. Every thing that you decide in life, God says, inc- you include me in on it. God likes that. The soul's the chooser. God doesn't just want one block of your love, by the way. A Sunday morning only. He wants every place, every choice, every time. So that sounds like God wants everything. Yeah, you got it right. You're getting close. He wants it all. And by the way, when you give it to him, you'll be glad that you did. Because every time you say, God, I'll I'll give you this, but you won't have this, you are just saying, God, I'll just leave unknown blessings on the table that I'll never get. You know why you ought to come to church every time the doors are open? Yes, because God said it. Yes, because God loves you. But just selfishly, every time you don't do that, and every time a Christian doesn't do that, you're the Wednesday night crowd here. You're the 
preaching to the choir, but uh, I'm simply saying every time you decide not to do something that you could do under the realm of what God would have you to do, you don't know what you're missing out on. You say, well, I just missed that service. Okay, obedience is the key to everything that God has. And when you don't obey God, God cannot bless you like he wants to bless you. It's not just a church service, although it is. It may be a job God wanted to give you. It may be a financial blessing that God had in store for you. So I would have got it if I went to that church service. No, you will get it when you obey God. And that's why it goes back to point number one. I want to do anything that God tells me to do. I love him. I don't do it for God to bless me, but when I do it, he blesses me. Boy, so many Christians are missing out on so much just because we do not include God in the choices that we make. In all of life's choices, last phrase there on your outline on page one, and decisions that make you uniquely you, how often is God included or excluded? How many of your choices tonight include God? And I would challenge you when you go grocery shopping or when you ladies go to buy clothes or whatever you men, whatever you buy, I would challenge you every decision, every time you wake up, every time you go from one task to another, every time you get in your car, every time you eat a meal, every time you need to make a purchase, every time when you uh, stand in front of your closet in the morning, uh, you include God in every choice and decision that you need to make. It transform your life. Probably save you a lot of money, too. Might help you to dress better, too, some of you. Just kidding. Make you match clothes a little bit better. God says, you know, <laughs> that don't go together. Thank you, God. Um, or your wife does that for you, I guess. Number three, how does God want us to love him? With the mind. With your mind. I'm on the next page there. The mind is where we make judgments, and we'll just quickly go through this one tonight. Do you care tonight what God thinks about your situations of life? Again, the, the, the mind represents where we, we make our judgments or our, our, our calls of life, if you will. And the question is asked there, do you care what God thinks about your situations of life? Do you care tonight, uh, again, about the, the, the decisions of the soul? Do you, do you care about God's opinion? Do you care what God thinks uh, do, you, do, you, do you care what God wants to do? Do you care about the judgments of God? Well, that's what I think is best. God says, if you love me with all your mind, it, it will not matter what you think, but you will crave, God, what do you think? I don't pray, and I, I, I know I say this a lot, but I'm, I'm trying to drill it in your heart. I don't pray much, God, give me. I pray a lot, God, show me. I'm not concerned about going to God and telling Him what I want. I'm concerned about God showing me in my life what He wants. I don't want to tell God my judgments. I want to learn His judgments. You know, my judgments are perverted and wicked. I mean, Jeremiah 17, 9. That's my heart. I want to know what a sinless, holy God thinks and wants. So it's not God give me but God, show me. And by the way, God will give you. If I don't pray, give me, give me, give me, God won't give me. Yes, he will. God is looking tonight for someone to love him with their heart, with their soul, and with their mind. And when you love God, you are keeping his commandments. And when you keep his commandments, you're obeying him. And obedience is the key to everything he has. And God will pour your blessings out in your life. Fourthly is this, God says, I want you to love me with all your strength. The word strength here is an interesting word. It means it's not so much the strength to get through the day, but it's the strength of forcefulness. And what God is saying here is it, to love him with all our strength is to love God with all my strength is to say nothing again or nobody is going to take God's love from me. You know, why do we let godly things go? It's the answer is there because we don't love God. And when I love God with all my strength, again, it is me saying, God, all the demons, all the devils of hell, a family member, a bad day, a time of illness, a financial reversal, there will nothing separate me from the love of God. All hell itself or a family member that I love that doesn't understand what I'm doing, God, I will love you. And I will be forcible about it, not 
to people, but I will make sure nobody or nothing separates me from the love of God. I settled 18 plus years ago. It would be 19 years this February when I got saved. I really understood for the first time in my life that Jesus loved me. And there have been a whole lot of things over these past 18 years to convince me other than that. Illness, financial problems big time, sin, people, discouragement, struggles. God using you one minute and you think, boy, he's on your side. And the next week you fall flat on your face and think, I'm the biggest failure in the world. I mean, all these emotional highs and lows. But for some strange reason, I don't know what it is, the grace of God or whatever forcefulness I've had, I've never let anybody or anything convince me that God doesn't love me. And I probably haven't loved him with all my heart as I should or maybe even all my mind or my soul. I I know I haven't included him in all my choices. But I've never let somebody convince me that God doesn't love me. I'm going to be very forceful about that. You tell me tonight God doesn't love me, you're crazy. We live in America. I read my Bible today. And not only can I rejoice that I have a Bible uh, that I own. Do you realize there's people all over the world that would covet to hold what you hold in your hands and never read? And yet we can go down to the dollar store and pick one up for a buck. They would want a page out of your Bible tonight. They'd give a week's salary some parts of the world for one page of the Bible. And yet we have the whole thing and we don't even know what it says. And yet I challenge you maybe the next time you do read it to realize, you know what? Not only do you have a Bible and live in a country where you can have a Bible, but you have eyes that can see the words. And I don't do it very often. I'm not a great Christian tonight, but very often... Before I even begin to read the Bible, I stop and say, oh, thank you, God, that I can see the words because there may be a day when I can't. Thank you, God, for my sight. Thank you, God, that when I uh, read these words in just a moment, I have a a mind that can understand and comprehend. And, God, I don't want to ever sit in a nursing home or uh, uh, get old someday and my eye grows dim and my my mind grows dull. And, God, that, that I can't enjoy that book. And not only do I thank you that I have it, but I thank you that I can see it and read it and understand it. Oh, you're lost. Don't you tell me God doesn't love me. He fed me today. He's been so good to me. I got a house to go to tonight to live. I got clothes on my back. It's all because of God, a great church. God loves me. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life fighting anything or anyone, not personal attacks, understand, but anyone that would try to convince me otherwise. Don't you tell me God doesn't love me. I'm going to love God with all my strength. And that means nothing or nobody is going to take God's love from me. Those four areas when Jesus was asked what was the great commandment. And the great commandment was to love him with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. I hope it gives you just a little bit better understanding tonight how God wants us to love him. Let's pray. Father, I pray tonight, and Lord Jesus, that not only would we learn again the truths of another very familiar passage of Scripture, but that we would apply it. Lord, I I hope that we would learn, especially point number one, because oftentimes I think that we think we're, we're, we're okay. And Lord, any testimony of victory tonight that I might have mentioned in the message was not a praise to me, but just a, a praise to your grace in my life because I realize I'm a wicked, sinful man at best. God, I realize I hurt you every day of my life and fail you and do things and think things and say things that I should not do, think, or say. But yet, Lord, I'm reminded, as wicked as that heart is, I, I can take that same sinful devotion and turn it into a loving devotion. It challenges me. But, oh, Lord, help us not to think tonight that we're okay that we've arrived in any of these areas. Help us to realize that we fail in each one and we can fall in each one at any moment. 
But, Lord, help us to have a desire tonight to love you and help us to have a great realization in our lives how much you love us. You're an awesome God. Lord, I believe I'm talking tonight to just God's people. But the very first step that we ever need to take to realize the love of God is to realize that Jesus hung on a cross to die for our sins. And Father, if there be anyone here tonight that doesn't know for sure that heaven's their home, I pray they'd settle that. They'd realize, as the Bible says, they're a sinner. They deserve to pay for that sin. The wages of sin is death. Death and hell. But thirdly, that the love of God sent His Son to die on the cross to pay for their sins. And that because God commendeth His love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, that as Romans 10.13 says, we can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And Father, I pray that we would uh, love you with everything that we have. If there be anyone tonight here or ever may listen to this message that's not saved, that they would take a moment, come to you and confess their sins and their need of a Savior, put their trust in Christ and be saved. Call on Jesus and experience that overwhelming love that will set them on a beautiful path of life to have a personal and growing relationship with an amazing God. So our Father tonight, help us to love you as you want us to love you in these four basic areas. Give us the wisdom, desire, and the determination to do it. And Lord, as we give tonight to our missions, would you bless tonight's offering? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.